Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you and, and mess up things, um, which I'm going to do anyway uh, after this talk or during this talk. Um, can everybody hear me? Also, people with the cheap tickets in the back? <laughs> Loud and clear? <laughs> okay. Um, it's true that I changed the title somehow, but to be honest, the title was not very, the original title, not very inviting, uh, I thought. Um, you know, I could bore you with, uh, with numbers and figures and graphs and stuff and complain with you, uh, as we always do, that we don't get enough money and that uh, there's so much more money in, in beta and gamma sciences and so on, and this is all true and, and we need more money and so forth and so on. And um, I would tell you nothing new, I guess, right? And uh, in the end, I will say that, that we need more money. <laughs> I'm, I'm spoiling a bit of a cliffhanger here, but otherwise the suspense would be probably too much. <laughs> so, yes, we do need more money. But the question is, why do we need more money? And um, what, I, what I want to do in the 40, 45 minutes that I have, I'd like to convince you that far from being useless, um, I'm exaggerating here, of course, but, but nevertheless, it's true that many, many people uh, would agree with this kind of cartoon. This is a guy applying for a job at Star, Starbucks or something, and the manager says, well, it's not a requirement, but if you have a PhD in the arts or humanities, it's definitely a plus. It's only a slight exaggeration. Eh? We, we see the humor in it because we know there's a truth in it, right? Uh, it seems to be useless. If you're a parent and your 16, 17-year-old daughter or teenager tells you, well, I want to go study something in the liberal arts or the humanities, uh, you have reason to panic. Right? They're going to be dependent on you for a long time and so on, right? So th there's, there's a truth in that. But what I want to convince you of is that this is a totally wrong perspective. In fact, the humanities, and I might be slightly biased here, I admit, the humanities are the most important field of studies in the whole of what you can study at university or high school or whatever. Right? I'm, I'm, people who know me know this. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of the natural sciences and I like mathematics and so on. But uh, it's really the humanities that are the most important fields of study. I see surprised looks on your face, but you should already be convinced of that. Um, I hope to explain to you why I think this is the case. These are the points I want to address today. Um, I want to show you a little movie clip in which President, former President Obama uh, says something wrong, really, something really wrong. And I'm going to take that as a starting point uh, for, my, for my lecture of today. I'm going to say a few things about making money and the humanities. I'm going to explain to you that what it means to be human is really what it means to be a storing, storytelling animal. I'm going to address some questionable aspects about the research that we're doing. So I'm, I'm also going to be critical about what we're doing. The fact that we are sometimes looked down upon or frowned and, and so on, well, that there's reasons for that and we need to address these reasons. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be self-critical also uh, in a way. I'll talk about the divide between the so-called two cultures, connecting the dots, you'll see what I mean by that. And then I'll say something about the importance of being out there, by that I mean the importance of talking to lay people and so on. You know, just not being in your ivory tower, but going further than that. By then it'll be around 7 o'clock, and um, after the applause it'll be 7.30, and then it's time for... Uh, <laughs> Then it'll be time for the reception. Okay. Unless Steph is giving me a sign that I should stop. All right. Um, 
Now, first of all, let me show you that little movie clip. Um, it'll be of interest to all of you. So you see President Obama President Obama learns a lesson about picking on art history. Saying something. President Obama learns a lesson about picking on art history majors. An art history professor took issue with the president, uh, a remark the president made during a speech last month. A lot of young people no longer see the trades and skilled manufacturing as a viable career, but I promise you, folks can make a lot more potentially with skilled manufacturing or the trades than they might with an art history degree. Uh, now, nothing wrong with an art history degree. I love art history. So I don't want to get a bunch of emails from everybody. Okay. The sound wasn't too good, but you've all understood what he said, I think. Um, you better study something like, uh, you know, carpentry or whatever. Um, learning a skill, a real job, uh, then studying art history. Of course, at the moment he said it, he realized that he shouldn't have said it, right? But nevertheless, I think this tunes in with how many people think about the humanities. This is art history, but literature, uh, y you name it, right? So there's that bias towards what we are doing, and it's broadly shared in society, I think. Now, he literally said you can make more money with, you know, by teaching yourself a skill or going to a, a school that teaches you a skill instead of doing art history. I have to ask the question, of course, is this true? Well, not necessarily, of course. I have a website here. I'm, I'm not going to show it to you. You can find it for yourself and check it out. There's many people uh, who make a lot of money who have a background in the humanities, CEOs of you. God knows what, right? So, of course, you can make money when you studied art history or whatever. But I don't think that's the point. Hmm? President Obama was criticized by uh, a professor of art history from uh, University of Texas, if you pick that up. And s she apparently said, um, well, art history teaches you to think critically. And I guess that's right. Huh? But I don't think that's really why we are doing this. I also don't think we are doing this to make money, right? So I want to address the question here, why are we doing this? What's the point? Um, perhaps some of you will be familiar with this book. It's also translated by uh, an Indian-American journalist, Farid Zakaria, who wrote a book in, in defense and praise of a liberal education, so the study of the humanities. And he also basically points out in his book that you want to study the humanities because it teaches you how to think critically. Again, I guess that's true, but I do not think that's the point. All disciplines teaches you, teach you how to think critically. I mean, quite obviously, I guess. For instance, here Steve Jobs says, everybody in this country should learn to program a computer because it teaches you how to think. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I mean, when I was a kid uh, and I asked why I had to study mathematics, I was told, well, it teaches you to think and to think critically and so on. I mean, there's no discipline that teaches you to think uncritically. So, obviously, all disciplines in university t must teach us something about what it means to think critically. So, I do not think that's the main point here. If you just sit back and relax and do some armchair reasoning, what else can you come up with? Why would you study the humanities? Well, here are some, I think, obvious functions, if I may use this word, it might satisfy your curiosity. You really want to know, right? What's this book about? Uh, what happened in the Middle Ages? Uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. It creates beauty and a sense of meaning. I think that's also true, and I'll come back to that, especially the latter thing here. It might replace bad ideas and get rid of superstition. I could give many examples. Of course, it can also create bad ideas, I think. I'll, I'll come back to that, too. It may reduce fear and anxiety. It can enhance your happiness, but maybe not all the time, anyway. And it helps you to study and promote positive values, whatever they may be. So these are all things you can come up with if you just, you know, think about it and have some 
have a discussion, a conversation about, it, about that uh, in a bar or whatever. These are quite obvious things, I guess. Martha Nussbaum, you're all familiar probably with uh, American philosopher Martha Nussbaum. She usually writes very thick books, rather boring books. Uh, but th this, this one is a short one, and, and I like it. It's, it's a book um, about the value of the humanities, and she explains that to become a, a citizen, and to support democracy, and to realize what it is to be a citizen in a democracy, you need knowledge of the humanities. And I like that, but I don't think it, this is going to the core of what exactly it means to study the humanities. So the deep importance to me, and I'm, I'm not inventing anything here, of course, I'm picking this up from other people, is this, right? I guess everybody understood what, what it said, eh? but in case you didn't, it's the old Greek saying that you have to know yourself, right? And if you look at the most important works in art and, and literature from the Greeks to, to today, you'll find that over and over again. There's a focus and emphasis on the question, what is... Mankind. What does it mean to be a human being? Here's a famous quote, you, you're all familiar with it, of course, um, from Shakespeare in Hamlet. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty and form and moving, how express and admirable, in action how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. So we're quite something, right? But then Shakespeare says, and yet to me, or Hamlet says, what is this quintessence of dust. The quintessence, I don't know if you know this, it's the fifth, um, the fifth kind of stuff. Huh? The Greek had four kinds of stuff. Earth, water, air, fire. And the fifth uh, stuff, form of stuff, uh, was the stuff that the stars were made of. And so we are the fifth, we're made of the fifth kind of stuff. We're dust, but, but very special dust. See, this, uh, so it's very ambiguous the way Shakespeare tries to explain what we are or who we are. Uh, you're familiar with that scene, of course. It's, it's really man contemplate, contemplating about uh, himself. David Hume, 18th century philosopher, said, there's no question of importance whose decision is not comprised in the signs of man, and there is none which can be decided with any certainty before we become acquainted with that science. He calls it a science. It's... Uh, Psychology as such did not exist yet. Uh, David Hume is a philosopher, so the boundaries are, are unclear there, of course. But, but I think this is correct. And I think the humanities in general try to address specifically the quote by Hamlet or Shakespeare, the, the remark here by David Hume. So this is really what it is about. You'll find it in art. What are the questions that we want to answer when we wonder about ourselves? when we wonder about what it means to be a human being. And you want to know where you come from. You want to know your position in, in the rest of creation or nature or, or the cosmos. You want to know where you're going to, right? Several related questions are really deep and universal questions. You'll find them all over the world, in mythology, in all cultures, in all, on all continents that humans inhabit. Probably prehistoric art ponders already about these very questions. So we need the humanities to answer these questions. And then you might ask, but why do we need to answer these questions? Well, I'll try to come to that too. Modern science, of course, has hugely influenced the way we try to think about these questions. What you see here is a modern view of the evolution of life. This was published in Science some years ago. So there's, there's the origin of life, and it, it's spreading out over millions and billions of years, and it splits and it diverses and so on. And so the edge of the circle is, is the present, right? And every little thing here is a species. This is just a small sample, really. In reality, there's much, much more, of course. And there you have the plants and the protista and the fungi and so on. And here are the animals, right? And this you cannot read, but it says, 
you are here. This is where we are. So obviously this, this brings questions with it. What does it mean to, to have that place over there among animals and the rest of life? What does that tell us about ourselves and about the meaning of life? So Hamlet was looking at a human skull, but here you see an ape looking at a human skull. And this is the effect, of course, of modern science, of evolution and, and DNA research and paleontology and so on. But it's still the humanities, not the natural sciences, who need to address these, these questions, uh, I think. You're all familiar with uh, Casper and Hobbes, and Casper asks here, um, I wonder why man was put on earth, what's our purpose, why are we here? And the answer is tiger food. We all know this is not true. It could make us uncomfortable, but who has a better answer, right? I think these are the, the main, the core questions what the humanities must ask and must address. Again, it's not the natural sciences who are going to do it for us. So let me try to come up with something that might give an inclination about how we can address this very question in the humanities. What is the most human thing about humans? Which obviously should be the core business of the humanities. What is the difference between us and other primates? What are the similarities? And what does it mean that we are, say, 98% genetically related to other species, like chimpanzees and so on? For many people, this is a strange thing to know, but it's true. But you're all also 50% genetically related to bananas. So what does that tell us, right? Okay. I think a really, really important aspect of all this is told or brought forward by this picture here. What you see here is a storyteller. It's a picture of 1947 by the Sun people living in the Kalahari Desert. And this man is telling stories to, to the rest of the tribe, if I may call it that. And I think this tells us something about really who we are, something really, really important of what it means to be a human being. If you think about it, I think the, the different disciplines in the humanities, what we're really studying is ourselves as storytellers. This relates to language to literature, art, religion, science. Science, of course, also tells stories. These stories happen to be true, more or less, right? But it's stories nevertheless. The Big Bang story is a wonderful story. Just another story instead of creation myths. It's much more true than creation myths. But these are stories nevertheless. And we love to tell stories about origins, about life and death, war and peace, and about the meaning of life and everything. So the question here is, why is that? Why do we tell these stories? Without these stories, there would be no humanities. There would be nothing to study. This is at the core of what it is to be a human being. We tell stories. Little children invent stories even before they can talk. This has been really good research. Very young children already invent stories and, and play, play role games and so on. And it also has been studied what these stories are about. And if you've never paid attention to it, it might come as a shock. I'm, I'm giving a little bit away already of the answer to the riddle here. Little children still tell stories about daddy leaving the family and the baby is dying and so on. It's, it's tough stories, horrible stories usually. Little children, three years old. Hmm? Why do we invent conspiracy theories? It's, it's a compulsive thing. Why do we gossip so much? I don't know if you know this, but about 70% of our conversations are really gossip. Also, when you're a scientist, for instance, you gossip. You, at conferences, during the coffee break, you start talking to an American colleague or whatever. You don't really talk about his research. You say, did you hear about the colleague from Princeton, well, he has cancer, and so on. You gossip. That's, that's really what you do. I would gossip here too, but this is filmed, so I'm not gonna... I can't. Hmm? 
Why do we see stories even in random stimuli? It's a compulsive thing. We can't avoid it. We turn everything into stories. If you think about it, you'll know it's true. Let me give you a brief example of this, about how this works. You see here a, a triangle and a, something like a circle, and underneath it says once upon a time and so on. The reason why is, is this. I'm going to show you a little movie clip. It's without sound, and it's over 50 years old. It's invented or made by two psychologists, Heider and Simmel. Why exactly? Well, because they wanted to study autism. So it's an old clip, but I like, I like it. It still works fine. And the thing is, they realized that if a child that has autism looks at this, what it sees is it sees mathematical figures moving around. And that's it. But what you will see, if you don't have autism, that is, <laughs> you see a storyline in this. You see emotions and suspense and maybe even a female and, and male, and this is a bully, I'm just inventing this, but I think most of you can follow this storyline, right? And uh, this one is scared now, and, and he wants to help her, oh, and now she escapes, and he's mad, but he's going after them again, and so on. So there's a whole story in it with emotions and plans and, and agency and so on, and when I stop it before it's done, you're maybe disappointed because you want to know how it ends. <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense. There is no story. It's just mathematical figures moving randomly around. But your brain compulsively turns this into a story. And this is what you do. You see faces in the clouds, and you invent conspiracy theories, and you see agency and meaning and so on. Even when it's not really there, your brain goes in overdrive. You dream up stories every night. Your brain is even, even when there's no stimuli from outside, your brain comes up with stories. Might be absurd stories because there's no checkup with reality, but th they're stories nevertheless. This is what we do. And I think to understand this, if you understand this little clip by Heider and Simmel, understanding by this now I mean if we would understand why we are doing this, then I think we would understand the, the core of the importance of the humanities. Okay, so I'm going to give you a clue of what I think might be the answer to this. And if I'm right, then I think this, this is what the humanities really are all about. I think we can find a clue in the fact that it's a very conspicuous thing about the world's best known stories that they all deal with really, really serious problems. Look at the Gilgamesh story, for instance. Maybe the oldest story that we, we have, in our culture at least. There's trouble going on. It's really about trouble. There's a fight between the king and, and the other guy, and so on. And then they become friends, but then the friend dies, and, and so on. It's, it's, it's a very problematic story. In the first pages of the Bible, there's already a guy who kills his own brother. It's a serious problem. It's very violent. It's your worst nightmare if you have a brother that you might kill him, or, or even worse, that he might kill you. Hmm? Think of Homeros. There's page after page, there's war and killing and jealousy and, yeah, and fights and so on and so on. In our time, why is the Lord of the Rings so popular and the Hobbit? It's, it's really it's stories about serious problems. Harry Potter. Or the gaming industry thrives on fights and troubles and violence and so on. The gaming industry, by the way, is now more financially, economically more booming than, than the movie industry, right? It's the gaming industry that is bringing us stories also. Hollywood is also creating stories, of course. So the most important movies of our time and the most popular games that millions of people are playing are very violent. 
They deal with very serious issues of death and life and killing and so on. So I think this is very important. It's, it's something you cannot look away from. The stories that we like and that we study in the humanities, one way or another, are very, very problematic. If you, if you want to watch a movie Saturday evening, and it's a movie about, say, a guy and, and his wife is giving him uh, a list of uh, things he must go buy uh, at the supermarket, and he's taking the kid with him, five-year-old kid, and so they're, they're gone to the supermarket, and he has his list, and they walk around with the cart in the supermarket, and they, they, they pick the things they need, and so on, and this takes an hour, and then he comes home and says, honey, we have everything, and she says, well done, and the movie is over. <laughs> That's not the kind of movie you're going to like watching. It's only interesting when the guy leaves with the child, and then the child is kidnapped in the supermarket. <laughs> or, or a terrorist attack happens, and, and, you know, the guy and his child are hostages or something. Or the woman gets a visit from her lover while the man is gone. Or they have a car accident. There must be serious trouble. That's the kind of movie you want to watch, right? If you're honest about it, that's what we like. That's what we love. Why is that? Well, I, I would say it's in our nature somehow, but why? That's the main question. Okay. Well, I think the explanation here basically is that we come up with all these stories from mythology to gaming stories nowadays because they work for us as a flight simulator. This is a metaphor you want to follow or you don't, but I'm going to briefly explain it. You know what a flight simulator is? If you want to become a pilot, before you can actually fly with a plane, you need to fly around in a flight simulator. And they're going to send a storm at you or uh, whatever, the, the engine fails or, you know, they're gonna, stuff is going to happen. And you might even crash, right, if you can't fix it. You're in the process of becoming a pilot. But that's not a big deal because it's only a flight simulation. It's not real life, right? Well, stories are the flight simulators of real life. We love these stories and they must be problematic with serious issues about love and that and emotion and children and family and betrayal and all that. Think of Hamlet that I mentioned or the Lord of the Rings. It, it must be, there must be a, you know, an issue in it, things to overcome. And sometimes it must fail also, right? Because this is preparing us for what it means to be a human being in real life. And you can fail in the story. It's the protagonist, really, that are killed instead of you. Right? That's the use of stories. And that's really what humanities are studying. You might say, well, Maybe not in my case, because I've read many books, but I've forgotten most, I forgot most of them. So how can I use them in real life? And it's true, of course, that this is not the way it works. Nobody who has, say, a relationship problem will ask himself, well, what did Shakespeare tell me about this? Or uh, I, I've read uh, Love in Times of Cholera. How did that work out again? That's not the way it works, right? But all these movies you've seen, all these novels you've read, and so on, and all the, when you're in the field of humanities, all the studies you've encountered about these stories, they are somewhere in your implicit memory. They're there. They turn you into what it means to be a human being. So we create these stories, of course, they're all created by human beings, from the Gilgamesh epos to The Hobbit. But they turn you into the human being that you are, too. They're, they're in your mind, they're in your brain. Most of what you know is implicit knowledge. It's like learning to drive a car. In the beginning, it's all a conscious thing, which is a horrible thing. Because you must think about your left foot and your right hand, and you must think about everything. But after a while, it goes to your implicit memory, and you do it subconsciously, you do it automatically. And that's a good thing. So I think all these stories that are studied by the humanities, they make us good drivers, so to speak, in real life. 
That's what they're for. And so if you want to know how this works, we need the humanities. What else can teach us about how this is working? It's basically about it, what it means to be a human being, to have emotions, to act, to, in, to, to have social interactions, to deal with life and death and everything. That is what it's all about. Okay. This is the m main thing I think that I wanted to tell you, but I have a few other things. It's often said that the research we are doing is fundamental. There's fundamental research and there's applied research. I think it's true, most of what we're doing is fundamental research. But what does that mean? It means that it's not practical, not directly functional. At least if you compare it, say, with research in medicine or engineering, we, we don't build bridges and things like that. Okay. But nevertheless, sorry, nevertheless, our aim, the final aim of the humanities is clear. It's about understanding what it means to be a human being, as I hopefully try to explain when I talked about ourselves as storytelling animals. So that's why we really want to study human nature and all its aspects and products. Cognition, behavior, communication, culture in the broad sense of the world, word. So the label fundamental research cannot be an excuse for nonsensical or what I call arty-farty research. This, this is the critical part of my talk, eh? you, you can understand that, right? I think there's too much research going on in the humanities that's, that doesn't really fit in the broader aim of the humanities, which is clarification of what it means to be a human being. We are an elite, of course we are an elite. I mean, it's a luxury if you can study literature, movies, art, uh, and so on, history, of course. It's only a small minority of people who are actually able to do this professionally. But we shouldn't do it for the elite. We should do it for humanity. And I think there's a lot of research out there that's elitist for the elite, right? And I think that, that's my, that might give us a, a bad name or a bad reputation sometimes. Nobody sees the point. Well, if we would manage to explain to people we are doing this to explain to you what it means to be you, I think we should get more credit. Perhaps some of you will be familiar with um, the website that, uh, that's called the Postmodern Essay Generator. I don't know if you are. Uh, well, I'm going to show it to you. I have to. Okay, this is a fun website, but it's also making me sad in a way. It's a website that creates nonsensical articles. Here you have one called Nihilism, Subcultural Capitalism and the Modern Paradigm of Narrative. Department of Semiotics, Department of Gender Politics, Discourse of Failure. So you have a whole article, Spelling and Leotardis Narrative and so on, with footnotes and a bibliography and so on. It's total nonsense. But if you would read it, you wouldn't right away understand this, that it's total nonsense. If I refresh the page, which I'm doing right now, it gives you a new article, just like that. It's again total nonsense, it's a whole article, again. And it contains all the right buzzwords that you're all familiar with. Post-cultural structuralist theory, Narratives of genre, it all sounds right to many of you working in the humanities. Let me do it again. <laughs> Deconstructing Bataille, subcapitalist rationalism in the works of spelling, and so on. So I can do this a billion times. I'm not going to do it, but it's, there's endless variation on this. These are all nonsensical articles. But they're sometimes hard to distinguish from real articles in real journals. And this is a problem. So we need to get rid of this, I think. Close all of this, yes, no? Okay. Okay, so this raises the question then, what to study and of course also what to teach. And in line of what I just said, and now I'm gonna say something very dangerous here, in a sense. But this is just metaphorically speaking, of course. Perhaps we need a little bit less 
doctoral thesis on Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. And those of you are who are familiar with Finnegan's Wake know what I'm talking about here. And maybe some more studies on the poetry of Bob Dylan. I'm probably defending a minority position here, right now in the humanities. When Bob Dylan won his Nobel Prize, or the Nobel Prize, this is to warn me that my time is almost up. When Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize, I think many of you frowned upon it. He's just, well, he's a singer. He sings songs. He's not a real writer, not a real poet, and so on. To be honest, in the beginning I also thought, well, what are they doing there in Sweden? But then I, I, I thought a little bit deeper about it, and now I'm convinced they made the right decision. Of course, Bob Dylan is a poet. He's just singing his poems. Nobody buys poetry anymore now. This is true. If you're a poet and you sell 100 copies of your latest book, you should be happy. But people know millions and mil millions and millions of people know many, many, many poems by heart. We can all sing these songs. Young people know the, 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 the hip-hop music, the rap music, and so on. And what I see is there are, but it's still very rare, academic articles and PhDs written on rap, hip-hop, and all these kind of things. This is the poetry of today. They sing it now. There's a beat underneath it. Or people use a guitar to support their poems. And that's okay. But it, it, in academic circles, it's considered to be, well, it's not the real thing. We need another PhD on Finnegan's Wake. Huh? Well, I, I, I doubt that. I think this tells us more about who we really are and about what the humanity should be about than this. This is a literary experiment, and that's all fine. And We can use a couple of PhDs on this, but... But this is not going to help us in understanding ourselves, the storytelling animal. This is. You know what I mean by now, okay? All right, so we must understand, not just play games. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit harsh here, but my time is very limited. Huh? We mustn't play games, we must think about methodologies. We are part of a scientific endeavor, or at least we should be, right? We should, you know, we're part of the puzzle, not a separate part. Part of the puzzle of figuring things out. That's what we want to do. So if our research cannot be communicated to so-called lay people, I think it's a waste of time and money. If it cannot be connected to research in other disciplines, it's highly questionable. And if it's not part of the great quest to understand ourselves, then I think it's really useless, and useless here in the wrong meaning of the word. In the bad sense. Okay. Few last words. This guy is uh, C.P. Snow. He was a physicist, but also a writer. He wrote novels. And he wrote a famous essay about 60 years ago now already called The Two Cultures. Some of you will be familiar with it. And he complains in this uh, essay about the fact that in academia, there's really two cultures. The culture of the humanities on the one hand, and then the culture of the natural sciences and the applied sciences on the other hand. And Snow regrets that the water has become very deep between these two cultures. And I think he's right. And I think it's, it's even worse now. Snow points out, for instance, he's giving the example, that everybody in the humanities will agree that you must know what Hamlet is about. If somebody would say, well, um, I've never heard of that guy, Shakespeare, and I, I couldn't care less, that would, be, that would be a weird thing, right? If a scientist would say something, you would look down upon him. But if I would ask you, writes Snow, you, working in the humanities, what do you know about thermodynamics? Can you tell me something about the second law of thermodynamics? Have you ever heard about entropy? And you would say, no, I couldn't care less. And by the way, I failed in mathematics at high school, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> well, that's a crazy thing. That's crazy. That's nonsense. But it's the true situation, right? 
So we need, to, we need to be more in touch with the other sciences. If you want to understand what it means to be a human being, we cannot just focus on the output of human beings. You must know the connection between everything, of course. So we need a third culture. And in fact, this is happening, but it's still a very small thing. A third culture is looking for the connection between the humanities and the other sciences. All right. So this is called coherentism, which is a bit of a jargon word, of course, but, but I kind of like it because it, it gives you right away the, the idea. Right? Science in general, including the humanities, should be something like a crossword puzzle. And so what we figure out must connect to other things we figure out. And I think there's too much research still going on that doesn't connect with anything at all. It's just the game that we're playing. So if you're working on a PhD, you have to ask yourself the question, what am I doing? Is this attachable to other things in the sciences? In a meaningful way, does it tell us something about what it means to be a human being? If you're working on your PhD right now, and after this lecture you say, well, no, I cannot do this, so I'm going to stop. Well, I'm sorry, that was not the point here, but, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, we need to avoid Sokal, Sokal's hoax. Are you familiar with Sokal? Maybe the young people aren't, or the younger people. Very briefly, Alan Sokal is a physicist, and almost, or already 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, he wrote a total bogus article in the style of that postmodern essay generator that I pointed out, and he sent it to um, a serious journal, and they published it while it was total nonsense. And then, of course, in another journal, he explained what he had done, and, yeah, and a, a whole culture war broke out. I think we're still dealing with this. We should avoid that people like Alan Sokal can do this. Right? We should be more knowledgeable about what's going on in other disciplines. So we need to connect the dots, as I like to call it. We need to answer why questions. Why questions are really what it means to be who we are. This is what the humanities should do. I think we've been quite good in studying what we do, of course. And also in how we do it, kind of. We study the products of ourselves, of our cognition and behavior. Literature, poetry, art, music, dance, and so on. But we still haven't figured out why we are doing this. People, people dance, for instance. Why? People who do academic research on dance can tell you a lot about it, but if you ask the simple question, why are people dancing? It's still a very mysterious thing. Why are people singing? Why do people make art? Why do we tell stories? Well, I think I have an answer to that. But other things are still very mysterious, and this is strange. Right? You have a PhD in, in the history of modern contemporary dance. I'm just saying something, but you cannot tell me why we dance. This is strange. So I think this is something that we, we need to address. So we need to connect the dots between different fields of knowledge to come at the core of the humanities, to try to get at what it really means to be a human being. Okay, I'm, I'm really almost there now. This is the, 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 the disk that we've sent into space. Well, NASA did, some of you will know this in 1977, and there's music of Bach and Mozart on it, and, and art, and so on. I doubt that there's ever going to be intelligent beings, aliens out there, being able to understand what that record is doing, and so on, this is obvious. But it's more something that we did for ourselves. Eh? We've sent it to ourselves, in a way, to explain to ourselves what it is to be a human being. This is what we do. This is the best of what we have. There's art on it, music, but also mathematics and science and so on. But still, we need to address the question, why is this of importance to us? Why? This is still very mysterious. And humanities are really about that very question, I think. This I'm going to skip, because my time is, is up. This is connected to the former um, slide, but I'm going to skip it. All right. Final words. Are the humanities about making money? No. No. Can you make money? Of course you can make money. You're not going to starve to death if you studied arts or whatever. 
you'll, you'll find a job, of course, right? But it's not about making money at all. Right? That, that, that's just the, not the point. The point is about understanding ourselves, about, you know, you, you, you have one life. Socrates already said uh, the life that is not reflected upon is not worth living, right? or, or words like that. And you, you, you're familiar with that expression. It's, it's a slight exaggeration, of course. But there's also a truth in it. And this is what the humanities must do. So do we need more money? Of course we need more money. We're dealing here with the most important questions that you can possibly ask. We're dealing with questions about ourselves, about what it means to be ourselves. Okay? I think Obama would understand. Okay? All right. This is my last slide, so I'm going to stop <laughs> within reasonable time. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.